The first anime I ever watched was High School of the Dead. This was back in the early days of Netflix where most people didn't even have it, and I had yet to discover pirating or online access to anime. So I distinctly remember it. It was the 4th of July, and I was having horrible cramps, so I stayed behind while my family, including the uncle we were visiting, went out to watch fireworks. I love zombies. That's my excuse for unabashedly loving pretty much every bit of zombie media out there, no matter how poorly written or how bad the effects are. And in my defense, I was 12 at the time. As parents do, my mother came home at the worst possible moment, or so I thought, and I had to defend my choice of entertainment, which admittedly was difficult considering what was on screen. But then again, the only real difference between it and some live-action show was the medium. The misogyny and violence was not necessarily objectionable or even uncommon. In high school, I spent most of my four years in the anime club. One year, I was even the video chair and in charge of picking what we watched each week. I'll admit, my interest skewed towards horror, romance, and older shows, so while I knew of shows like Fairy Tale or Sword Art Online, I didn't watch them. My watch list varied from 1997's Berserk, Revolutionary Girl Utena, Black Butler, to Gaku Garashi. I typically knew enough to recognize popular characters at conventions, which I was an avid attender of, but I was picky. It took years for me to realize that the problem was not just the one show. High School of the Dead isn't even that extreme in comparison to some anime. It is a diverse art form which has many entries that should rightly be considered amongst the greatest art, same as we hold live-action movies and shows, as well as that which is at the bottom of the barrel, meant to be consumed and not thought about. But the entire medium is built on an objectification of women, a sexualization, and oftentimes a great hatred of them. It is a background noise that is often ignored, hardly of note, not just because Japanese culture remains so male-dominant and rigid against the tides of change, but because we are used to seeing women treated this way in all aspects of life and in all media. Everyone always tells me, like, Japan is so modest, it's so respectful, Um, the Japanese people are so polite. Um, Why, if it's so modest, can I literally go next door to the convenience store and I can buy child? I can just go in there and I can buy a magazine with idols. 13 years, 13 years old, 12 years old, in bikinis that are smaller than what I would wear as a fully grown woman. Why is that? Or why can I walk 20 minutes into like the drinking district and there'll be girls there, underage girls, older women, all kinds of women selling themselves, working in strip clubs um, to, so that they can pay their way in society because the wage here is so low and the minimum wage here hasn't changed since the 80s. Why is that? And why is it that in my whole time of living here, I've been living here for a year, that I have been assaulted, felt more uncomfortable here and felt um, just so weird about myself and my body around men in particular, and especially going places. That's why I don't like going places without my boyfriend um, than I ever have while living in Australia. And I've only been here a year. Why is that? Is that because Japan is so modest? No, especially in Tokyo, there is a facade of respectful and give and take, there's not, there is a deep, dark sexual problem with Japan and we don't talk about it enough. Japan has a problem with sexuality and the objectification of women and especially women that are minors. And that's why I'm not a big fan of the whole anime thing. Sorry, sorry to burst your bubble. I'm just not. Women's bodies are used to sell products. Facsimiles of women's bodies are merch. Women are edited and portrayed in impossible proportions, meant to cater to and groom male fantasies and female insecurities. Women are drawn with impossible and sexualized proportions. Let's talk about sexualization in anime and why it's bad. The number one reason is that it alienates an entire half of the population, and it makes an otherwise good anime or manga completely unrelatable. I want to be clear, there's a huge difference between an anime that has a few jokes here and there, like FMA, and one where the sexualization has become so rampant that it just feels disgusting. Like One Piece, what the hell was this scene? I love One Piece so much, but when scenes like this come on, I just... I consider quit. It's super sad because One Piece didn't used to be like this. Like, there were still some sexualization and sex jokes, but I felt that overall the women were respected. Like, now when, like, Hirokoshi's main running gag is, like, sexualization. Like, she's harassed by men so much, it's, it's painful. 
And people will say like, oh, it's shonen, what do you expect? But if I don't watch shonen, I don't get to watch action or adventure anime really at all. Like, I just want to enjoy the show. Women are shown on screen, in music, and literature, to need and want romance to be fulfilled, and for sexual subservience to her man to be integral to her own satisfaction. Women are animated to be hypersexual, either purposefully or accidentally for the satisfaction of a male audience, often placed directly in the role of recipient through a male character they are meant to imprint on. There is a genre of anime known as shoujo, which is a genre that includes anime made for young girls and is characterized by its focus on romance, drama, and personal growth. The art styles used are notably different and caters to the female gaze, not to be mistaken as the same level of impact as the male gaze, which has behind it a threat of violence and the resources and social power to create real impact. The female gaze merely refers to a reflection of the female desire, which is in turn greatly impacted by the demands of society she lives in. Hence why many romance shows and dramas exist which center around a rich man falling for a working class woman, the induction into luxury and an end goal of marriage. It is in no way revolutionary or counterculture, and while men may dislike the genre, it still grooms women into wanting a specific type of life and expecting a certain role within it. It still leads women into the domestic sphere. Some of the shows are worse than others, especially when it comes to sexuality and romance and the portrayal thereof, or when rape is romanticized and abusive relationships are painted as dark and alluring. The same elements that drew in audiences to Twilight and other young adult pairings are magnified through anime in the cultural lens of Japanese culture. One show which is often hailed as one of the staples of the genre, and yet as a revolutionary or subversive entry, is Oron High School Host Club. I didn't watch this one until college, but upon getting through the first few episodes, I could easily see why it had charmed the hearts of many. The cast is interesting and funny, and although some characters are less fleshed out than others, this works in its favor as it allows the audience to imprint what they want on them. The main character, Haruhi, stands out amongst other reversed harem heroines for having a strong personality and for her gender nonconformity. The animation holds up, and it's aged relatively well, and was even progressive for its time. However, I think that the nostalgia and enjoyment that many find in the series has caused them to overlook that Oron didn't escape from the same traps of other series. There are seriously problematic elements that many viewers don't recognize for what they are. Broadly, I could discuss more topics, but in this video, I'd like to focus on three main categories. Lesbophobia, gender presentation, and the portrayal of women we don't like. But for those of you who have never seen Oron, let me go over the plot. The comedic series revolves around the escapades of Haruhi Fujioka, a scholarship student at the prestigious Oran Academy, an elite private school for rich kids located in Bunkyo, Tokyo. Looking for a quiet place to study, Haruhi stumbles upon the otherwise abandoned third music room, a place where the host club, a group of six male students, gathers to entertain female clients with food, theme parties, and flirtatious conversation and behavior. During their initial encounter, Haruhi accidentally destroys an antique vase valued at 8 million yen, about 60,000 USD, and must work off the debt as the club's errand boy. Her short hair, slouching attire, and gender ambiguous face cause her to be mistaken by the host for a male student, though they soon realize her actual gender and the fact that she's a natural in entertaining girls. In response, they decide to promote her to a member of the host club so that she may work off her debt by procuring a certain number of clients by the time she graduates, all while concealing her gender from the rest of the student body, as well as their growing feelings for her. The series is a giant parody that has a lot of themed episodes. Rather than go through all of them, I'll only be recapping aspects relevant to my criticism. As for the characters, there are a few that are considered main characters. Haruhi Fujioka after her mother died 10 years prior, Haruhi took on many responsibilities around the house as her father worked to support them. Her father, working at what is essentially a drag club and her mother's job as a lawyer, have resulted in a young woman who is not preoccupied with how she's perceived by others and is instead focused on the practicalities of everyday life as well as working towards her goal of becoming a lawyer like her mom. She is fiercely independent, able to see others clearly, and despite her emotional intelligence, is sexually oblivious. Tamaki Suo the half-blood son of the chairman of Oran Academy, Tamaki is flamboyant and dramatic and yet very kind and willing to help others. He is the princely type and takes the role seriously in helping make girls happy. He's the main comic relief and spends much of the series under the delusion that his feelings for Haruhi are paternal and not romantic. 
Despite his popularity at the school, his paternal grandmother dislikes him for his heritage and often makes his life difficult by preventing him from seeing his mother, getting rid of the host club, and making him live in a secondary mansion away from the others in his family. Kyoya Utori Kyoya is the youngest of four sons and therefore assumed to have no chance at inheriting the family company. Through his friendship with Tamaki, he attempts to rise to his true potential to succeed anyhow. He is the vice president of the club, Tamaki's best friend, and the shadow king who is the one who truly runs everything. In addition to being the cool glasses type, he often schemes and manipulates others and has extensive dossiers on those around him. Hikaru and Karu Hidechin Prior to the host club, the twins had no friends and were distrustful of anyone around them due to being perceived as interchangeable. They are the definition of codependent, and their draw to the host club is forbidden brotherly love. They view the world as being us versus them, and for the most part, treat those around them as toys or distractions. Mitsukuni, Honey, Honey, Zuka. Honey, despite his small size, is much older is than the rest of the cast, and from a martial arts family well-renowned for their fighting ability. He's fond of sweets and cute things, which Tamaki convinced him to no longer hide, and is often portrayed as being more childish than the rest of the hosts. And finally, Takashi Mori, Moros and Maria Zuko. Mori and Honey come in a pair for the most part due to a long master servant relationship between the two families. Although joined in marriage two generations back, Mori is still very protective of his cousin, Honey, and is considered the wild type. This is the main general cast, though I will introduce new characters as they arise in my examination. So without further ado, number one, Lesbophobia. During episode nine, a challenge from Lobelia Girls Academy. Binio Binibara Amakusa, head of the Zuka Club at St. Lobelia Girls Academy, chances upon Haruhi and instantly realizing that she is a girl, tries to convince her to enroll at her school in her club. Along with two of her club mates, they disparage the host club and men in numerous ways, revealing their lesbian natures and belief in female superiority. Tamaki's half-Japanese slash half-French background is revealed, and Haruhi learns that one of her personal belongings was auctioned off on the host club's online auction site. She leaves the club in anger, and when convinced that Haruhi might be upset enough to transfer to St. Lobelia, the host Don freely dresses to show her that she can be around boys and girls at the same time as she remains at Oron. Haruhi finds this hilarious, but shares that she came to Oron Academy for a specific reason, and never planned on leaving. The Zuka Club girls leave, but refuse to give up, warning that they will be back for Haruhi. So at a glance, this seems like just any other episode. However, as I was rewatching the series, it occurred to me how lesbophobic the premise was. Let me explain. Lobelia is an all- You're a real pearl among swine. You know, coffee made by a maiden always has a more fragrant aroma. But this stuff's just instant. Oh. How about the four of us have a little tea party? <laughs> you girls have it all wrong! Don't you see there's nothing to be gained in a romantic relationship between two women? If that were the case, then why did God create Adam and Eve? <laughs> All girls private school, perhaps unlike all boys schools, all girls schools are often considered a hotbed for lesbianism. In Georgia, historical women's college, Agnes Scott, was well known for its high lesbian population. I checked out the college for that specific reason. And this is built on within the episode with the obvious portrayal of members of the Zuka Club as being lesbians, furthermore, man-hating lesbians. And these man-hating lesbians attempt the romance and steal Haruhi away from Oron Academy, regardless of her actual feelings on the matter. In their second appearance in the episode, Lobelia Girls Academy Strikes Back, the girls of St. Lobelia Girls Academy still want Haruhi Fujioka to join them. Binio, Binibara, Amakusa, and her lackeys will stop at nothing to involve Haruhi in a The White League Lily League's Zuka Club production, whose final scene is Haruhi receiving her first kiss from none other than the president of the White Lily League herself. It's up to the Oran Host Club and Ryoji Ranka Fujioka, Haruhi's dad, to save her from Binio's amorous intentions and to rescue her from the tacky maidens without incurring the wrath of the Benibara fan club. Don't let her go! This is not over yet! I don't care how many kisses she's had, the next one will be mine! <laughs> All I wanted to do today was go shopping. <gasps> In this episode, the Zuka Club takes Haruhi under false pretenses, forces her to play a feminine and submissive role to the masculine Binibara, with the goal of taking her first kiss through social pressure created through her role in a public performance. These episodes perpetuate three forms of lesbophobia. Lesbians as predators, straight women as victims of lesbians, and the man-hating lesbian trope. It also illustrates a common problem within the anime community and fandom community at large, where lesbophobia by women and fetishization by men is common, and fetishization of gay men by women is also pretty common. 
Lesbians have long been excluded from the feminist movement as the focus centered on a heterosexual experience. This is partially due to the presentation of heterosexuality as an integral part of the female experience and because homosexuality is viewed as deviant. This attitude is what led to the creation of the Lavender Menace, a group of lesbian radical feminists that sought to create a movement that would center them and consider their experiences. The phrase was coined by now leader Freddie Betty Friedan, who used it at a now meeting in 1969, claiming that outspoken lesbians were a threat to the feminist movement, arguing that the presence of these women distracted from the goals of gaining economic and social equality for women. It took until 1971 for lesbian issues to be included in the policies they sought to address and change. The exclusion of lesbian from women issues has been a result of the conflation of womanhood as being defined by her relation to man. Women who therefore choose not to associate with men, who lack an attraction to them, are thus portrayed as defective, as less women, and are othered in a way that heterosexual women are not. The same goes for masculine women, who are automatically viewed as homosexual, as femininity is also in relation to men and a form of subservience. Masculine traits are seen as positive in men and negative in women. Assertiveness becomes bossiness. Rationality becomes coldness. The traits viewed as feminine are submissive by nature, meaning that any form of agency in a woman is automatically ascribed a masculine label. Because this goes against the status quo, women are punished for masculinization, which is linked to homosexuality via the view of women as sex objects that are meant to be passive receptacles and not actors of sexual attraction. In from Invisible to Incorrigible, the Demonization of Marginalized Women and Girls, this experience is recognized as a masculinization framework, which lays the foundation for simplistic notions of good and bad femininity, standards that will permit the demonization of some girls and women if they stray from the path of true, passive, womanhood. A review of the media fascination with bad girls and crime provides clear evidence of the assumption that if women begin to question traditional femininity, they run the risk of becoming like men, and that is more violent and sexually loose, often conflated with interest and involvement in lesbian activities, particularly in prison settings. In other words, masculinity in women, often linked to homosexuality, is also associated with a criminal element. This relates to both the presentation of Benny Barra and the other Zuka Club members as being predatory, as well as in Haruhi's role as a straight woman in need of being saved from coercion into homosexuality. That the Zuka Club is so dismissive and dislikes the host club specifically for their maleness completes the trifecta with the insinuation of man-hating. The man-hating lesbian is a long-standing trope of anti-feminism, which positions the solution to be the right man, or in more crude terms, a good fucking. It implies a lack of ideological grounding for feminism, which they view as an attack on the way of life and often accuse of having gone too far. Pauline Harmange, author of I Hate Men, notes the futility of fighting against these claims, as feminists have spent a lot of time and energy reassuring men that no, we don't really hate them, that they're welcome. Not much has happened in exchange. Misandry lacks the resources and violence that misogyny does. At worst, it hurts the feelings of the man it is targeted at. One might be familiar with the quote that a man in a room full of women is ecstatic, but a woman in a room full of men is terrified. It is an entirely rational response to living in a patriarchal society, especially as a woman who does not have the romantic or sexual desire for a man. The combination of all three stereotypes, in addition to the presentation of the Zuka Club as buffoons or incompetent, altogether adds to a long-standing media history of a negative portrayal of lesbians. As a product of its time, one might be able to overlook these two episodes. All media is misogynistic to a degree, and I would call it impossible to find any mainstream media which manages to portray anything in an ideologically pure state, which is of course not what I'm asking for. I watch and enjoy plenty of shows, movies, books, and songs which have messages I may critique or object to, but most of these are acknowledged for their faults. The original Star Trek was amazingly progressive for its time, but falls short by today's standards. Its accomplishments are often tempered with recognition of its faults. Meanwhile, Oron has seen a bit of a revival, but it is either being consumed without critical analysis or is actively being interpreted as more progressive than it is. Which brings me to my next point. Number two, gender presentation. Haruhi Fujioka is mistaken for a boy when she enters the music room in search of a place to study. She's never very concerned about how others view her and is focused more on her studies than on her appearance. It is for this reason that she is initially mistaken for a boy and overlooked. Listen, senpai, I don't really care whether you guys recognize me as a boy or a girl. In my opinion, it's more important for a person to be recognized for who they are rather than for what sex they are. Well, isn't this an interesting development? Oh, yeah. 
The entire premise of the show hinges on her continued gender nonconformity and essentially cross-dressing. And yet, Haruhi is continually forced into and pressured into performing femininity. She is continually chastised for not being feminine enough. And one of the only reasons why she continues to present as male is because the host club dislikes the idea of other boys noticing her. You know what? I think both of us would be a little peeved if we had to watch all the guys flirt with her. Then that settles it. Otherwise, both her friends and her father attempt to force her to be more feminine, finding ways to make her wear dresses and feminine disguises through trickery and outright manipulation, such as changing her packed clothes for more suitable ones. Today, many Oran fans present this as being progressive and take Haruhi's gender nonconformity as proof of gender, fluidity, or as a non-binary identity. However, doing so ignores how her gender presentation is treated within the story as proof of being better or different than other girls and as a target for reform. The not-like-other-girls trope typically was traditionally presented through women who have internalized misogyny and who believe that they are different and therefore better than other women for disliking the traditionally feminine. Today, it is regarded as an unjust judgment of other women and femininity. Often, women who are gender nonconforming and continue to identify as women are inherently viewed as feeling superior to feminine women. I'm not like other girls. I don't wear makeup. You don't or you can't. I can't. I... This... I don't know what any of this is. I don't know what any of this does. This... I haven't opened this. I don't know what the... I, I just don't... I don't know what this is. I don't know what this does. And I don't care to know. I'm sorry. I just... What I have on my lips right now? Vaseline. That's what I use. These were gifted to me. Yeah, I cannot. You look beautiful, by the way. In other words, gender nonconforming women are viewed as pretentious in their differences, and as slighting other women for their choice not to perform, regardless of how they act or treat other women. What makes them stand out is at times celebrated, and yet simultaneously punished. The celebration of femininity in women typically ignores that this is not a minority position. Most women are feminine to varying degrees, typically centering on appearance, but also behavior. It also ignores that the reason traits are considered feminine to begin with is not because they are traits historically chosen by women, but rather imposed upon them. These same traits are meant to greatly oppose masculine traits to further exaggerate the differences between men and women and to justify the patriarchy. Often, this relies on benevolent sexism and romanticization of what is truthfully degrading and submissive, hence why romance media tends to focus on a partner that cares for, dominates, and plays into these paternalistic roles. Let's be clear, Haruhi is not non-binary or gender fluid or any other identity invented in the 2010s. She is a girl who does not care about how she's perceived by others, to the extent that being viewed as male does not faze her. She is so focused on her studies and such a good person that even those raised in a deeply sexist and misogynistic society, and it is important to note this applies not just for the time period or for general society, but for the location as well, view her in a positive light and vie for her attention. Those are all aspects of Oran Host Club that makes it stand out from other romance and reverse harem entries. Most romance or reverse harem anime and manga create a protagonist meant to be imprinted on, just as how Isekai does the same for men. The main character is meant to be somewhat shallow, somewhat featureless, so that the consumer can better identify as her. Haruhi is a special protagonist for being so well developed, for being gender nonconforming, and for receiving love and respect despite that. But that doesn't mean that the anime is some progressive, queer take on romance. Same as just about any romance, including those that are yaoi or yuri, or create different roles such as Omegaverse, still end up with feminine and masculine, submissive and dominant, just under different names or visages. Omegaverse is a subgenre of yaoi. Omegaverse stories in the genre are premised on societies wherein humans are divided into social hierarchies in animals. Keyword. I don't know. What is alpha? Is alpha just an A? Omega, Alpha, Beta. You have to keep in mind the animalistic nature. The Alphas are the dominant ones. The Omega, the submissive one, literally have a heat cycle. They go into heat like an animal. They produce like pheromones. I think they all produce certain pheromones like an animal would. This is key. They get pregnant. Male on male. Mammalian. There's also the beta. They're kind of like the normies. I don't think you quite understand the levels of animalistic tie-in we're talking about. 
You think getting pregnant is bad? The physical anatomy of a wolf. Do you know what a knot is? Well, if you're an omega, you're definitely gonna be familiar with that. I don't wanna go into specifics for fear of getting banned, but if I had to describe it with a sound, it's like a pop. Right? The result of pretending that Haruhi is an NB, non-binary, or trans in some way makes it easier to ignore that her biological sex plays a huge role in how she is treated by others, and how she is impacted by misogyny both in the text and from other characters. It deflects from the recognition of the fact that misogyny greatly impacts the lives of women and girls, regardless of how they feel about it or view themselves. And that brings us to number three, portrayal of women we don't like. Romance exists as a fantasy fulfillment that serves to guide women towards marriage and finding personal fulfillment in another person. It works alongside porn, which trains men to view women as tools for sexual fulfillment. I caught some fish the other day, and I'm going to rate them for which fish I think would give the best neck. This is a menpachi. It looks like it has a pretty small mouth, and then, hey, yo, that thing opens wide. It looks a little bony in the throat, though, so I'm going to say 4 out of 10. This Roy has a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth, and it looks like an absolute nightmare. I'm going to rate this, get that thing away from me. The parrotfish has a pretty smooth-looking throat, but that big beak looks like it could chomp through anything. Why don't you go ahead and close that thing up, Big Bertha? Finally, we have the Moo. Okay, this thing's got pretty good lips. Oh, and the teeth are so human-like. Damn, okay, Moo, what that mouth do? Okay, and the inside is a perfect shape. The Moo gets a 10 out of 10 rating, throat goat. That's all we need to see. Okay, that's all the stuff we saw. Bye. As one Tumblr user put it, it's like leading lambs to the slaughter. Oran follows this theme through its portrayal of women the narrative doesn't like. Come on, little one. Let daddy give you a big hug. I've already got a dad. I don't need another one. For example, the first episode sees a conflict between Haruhi and Princess Saika Ayano Koji, who is one of Tamaki's regular clients. She appears to be jealous of Haruhi, although because she does not view Haruhi as a woman but as a male student, this jealousy appears to be less of a romantic nature and more stemming from a dislike of their differing socioeconomic classes, to the extent that she tosses Haruhi's things into a fountain and tries to fake a sexual assault. This paints Saika as being a jealous, vapid, and cruel girl. But it also ignores that the hosts are just as rude about Haruhi's middle-class placement as even if they do take a different route to convey this. A short list of the times the host club exemplifies classism, sexism, or general rude behavior includes, but is not limited to, throughout the series, pictures of Haruhi dressed femininely, as well as various items of hers being auctioned off or used as prizes within the host club without her permission. One of the most egregious examples is of the twins photoshopping a nude picture of her for sale. Given that the show takes place in the early 2000s, it probably wasn't a good Photoshop, but the boundary crossing still remains, and in today's context, even if falsified, it would be enough to potentially ruin Haruhi's life. In episode 8, the group makes a bet to figure out what Haruhi is scared of with the prize of feminine pictures of her. They intentionally set out to frighten her. During this episode, she also ends up intervening when a group of boys sexually harass a pair of female guests, which results in her getting pushed off of a cliff. Despite, as she said, not having time to call for help, her bravery is rewarded with chastisement from the rest of the club and Kyoya pretending to want to rape her to illustrate the role that her gender plays and how others treat her and how she should act. Why did you confront them? What made you think you would stand a chance? You against two boys? But it doesn't matter that they're boys and I'm a girl. I was there, I had to do something. There wasn't any time to think- That's no excuse, you idiot! Don't forget, you're a girl! Look, I'm sorry you had to come and save me, senpai, but I don't understand why you're so mad at me right now. Looking forward to this trip, and we don't want to disappoint them. I'll pay you back for the flowers, senpai. Each bouquet cost me 50,000. That's a grand total of 600,000 yen, Haruhi. Uh, why'd you turn the lights off? If you want to, you can pay me back with your body. Surely you aren't so naive that you actually believe a person's sex doesn't matter. You've left yourself completely defenseless against me. So that's it. You won't do it, kill your senpai. I know. Because it wouldn't do you any good. You wouldn't gain anything from it. Hmm. You're right. You're a fascinating young woman, Haruhi. But... 
In episode 10, Tamaki convinces himself that being middle class is the same as being in dire poverty and insinuates himself into Harley's home along with the rest of the club under false pretenses. <laughs> This can't be right. Uh, hey, everyone, why don't you come in? I know it's not much, but please, make yourselves at home. I'll make us some tea. Um, I'm sorry. We don't have enough cups, but we do have some bowls. Uh, here. Hey, boss, what's with this place? She lives here? Maybe it's some kind of set. You know, like in the movies? I, 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 I hope so! Calm down, you guys. I bet this is the storeroom. I'm positive the infinite cosmos is just on the other side of that closet. Then should we try to open it? Now's not the time! Right. Since you guys decided to come by at lunchtime, my dad said it would be rude if I didn't offer you something to eat. We've been fasting for three days to save up money to buy something suited to your taste. <laughs> but it's all worth it as long as you guys like it. But, uh... A sushi sampler. It was marked down at the supermarket. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> In episode 15, the club stalks Haruhi to her summer job and forces her to let them stick around by blackmailing her due to their school not allowing work during breaks. In turn, many women are judged more harshly than men are within the show, whose bad behavior is painted as entertaining, humorous, and as less unfavorable. Haruhi tends to be non-reactive and conflict-avoidant, which allows the host club to often mistreat her or be forgiven for things that are absolutely boundary-crossing and potentially dangerous to her future and safety. In fact, this is the greatest detriment to her character, as her rolling with the punches attitude often crosses into being a pushover at times, particularly when she gets roped into playing doll or going along with the group's schemes. And I want to make this clear. I am aware that this is a satire, that the show itself wants you to scoff and point out at least some of these points, but as is often the case with a young audience, this can be overlooked or misunderstood. In fact, satire, pastiche, and parody are all often misunderstood by young audiences. It requires a broader understanding of the genre and culture as a whole to be able to recognize recurring themes and criticism of them. That's not to say that children's media must avoid using any of these, but rather that because of their intended audience, a more surface-level understanding of these type of shows should not go uncriticized. Not to mention, the text's constant waffling between pushing femininity on Haruhi and praising her nonconformity ends with Haruhi getting married and having kids. All celebration is tempered with reminders that Haruhi is female, and being female means having to act a certain way. Mori and Honey are martial arts masters. Teaching her martial arts that she can better protect herself is a far more protective way to react to a dangerous situation than to tell her after just being pulled out of the ocean that she's just a girl and should have known better than to stand up for other people or fight against boys. In that same episode, Haruhi goes so far as to describe Kyoya as a good person for using rape threats as a means to teach her. This behavior should not be idealized or depicted as sexually appealing. It's deeply distressing and terrifying if anyone were to experience it. There was no need to resort to such extreme tactics just to prove a point. Subsequently, Kyoya refers to her as intriguing because she remains unflustered by the threat, suggesting that she's not like other girls because she doesn't actually react to the fact that she was threatened in any realistic or expected way. In fact, the perfect girl seems to be one that is effortlessly pretty, who balances being caring without being overbearing, whose personality never gets in the way of what you want to do or want her to do. She's intelligent and willing to get her hands dirty, but she still upholds feminine duties like cleaning, cooking, and shopping. The girls that are painted as being lesser or more frivolous are those who express desires of their own that annoy or interrupt the desires of other characters. Haruhi's agency is only okay because it is constantly in service to others or unobtrusive. The male characters never get the same criticism or gender essentialism, as often references to homosexuality and comedic effect, along with a focus on other aspects such as racism or family issues, prevents it. This show is still one that I really enjoy. Haruhi is such an interesting character, and the show does subvert many tropes of the genre. Nostalgia plays a role as well, as I'm sure it does for many people. However, I simply can't ignore that Oran Host Club has some legitimate problems regarding its treatment of women, and the role that it plays in the greater romance genre and its socialization of its audience as to what they should expect from their own romances in the real world. Oran Host Club is not just reflective of romance or patriarchy, but of Japanese culture and, of course, an increasing trend in anime 
for what is essentially gender essentialism. If you, like, if you look at the comparisons of anime designs from the early 2000s, 90s, 80s, the women look far more realistic versus today's basically pug-nosed women who are hypersexualized. And of course, things that would be considered risque back then aren't commonplace or tame today. In general, it's one of the reasons why I have a hard time still loving anime. I still watch some of the ones that I liked when I was a kid, and that's mostly because the nostalgia makes it easier to swallow the bitter pills of stuff that's problematic, and I hate using that word, but there are aspects that I just wouldn't be able to stomach today because, I mean, hell, if you've ever seen Diabolic Lovers, there's such a romanticization of rape, of sexual assault, of going against people's boundaries in so many different anime, and it gets worse over the years in more modern stuff. Even in genres like horror, where you would think sexualization wouldn't be such an issue, it's there. And that's kind of my biggest issue with anime. It's like holding a micro, like a magnifying glass over how our world works and just blowing up these issues until they're, they could be satire, they could be parody, but truthfully, few people are going to view them as such. And I think that's probably for another video. <laughs> this, dear viewers, is where we part. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, let me know in the comment section down below. Do you still watch anime? Do you have a hard time dealing with shows that are just very, very explicitly misogynistic? Do you have to often stomach things that you didn't have to when you watched them way back when? Let me know what you think, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!